Welcome back to Jump Scare and Betty. And I'm Shad. This week we cover 1981's Ghost Story. I will take you places where you have never been. Just a start. I will show you things that you have never seen. Beginning. And I will see the life run out of you. Long ago, on a cold, dark night, in this peaceful New England village, something happened. Something too terrifying to remember. Something too frightening to forget. Something that has remained a secret until now. Is anyone else seeing things? Am I the only one having nightmares? Universal Pictures presents Fred Astaire, Melvin Douglas, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., John Hausman, Ghost Story, from the terrifying best-selling novel by Peter Straub. Who is this? He's found a picture of her. That's not possible. The girl, the men, the evil, the silence. Dad, I'm telling you something happened. I'm telling you something. I think he may have been murdered. The house, the fear, the nightmare, the vengeance, the terror, the truth. Not now, Rick. Yes. Now, something's happening. Something terrible. I fear that more of us are going to die. No, we, we, we must talk about it. Ah, uh, she is not the person that you think she is. <laughs> Who are you? Oh, no, please, let's not stop. She's worried you have the wrong idea about her. Everything about her is wrong. No, please, please let me talk about her. Get away from her, Dave. <laughs> what are you? She's dangerous. Listen to me, please. <laughs> Soon they will learn that they have never been forgiven. <laughs> Ghost story. The time has come to tell the tale. Celebrating its 40th anniversary this year, based on the novel by Peter Straub. And the novel's a little bit different than the book, or I'm sorry, than the movie. Yeah, um, and I, you know, it's one of those movies that, well, before we get into that, let's announce who is in this movie. We have Fred Astaire. Who doesn't dance. Who doesn't dance. If you don't know who that is, there might be a lot of people who have no idea who that person is. Uh, he was, you know, one of the old Hollywood dancer slash actor slash singer you know a man of many talents i think this was his last movie too probably it was the last movie for a lot of the people for all of them except for john houseman john houseman's in it who you may remember from a bunch of things as most especially the fog he's the guy at the beginning who's telling the story of the uh the dane the elizabeth dane alice Cridge is Ava slash Alma. She plays a kind of dual role. A dual role, but not a dual role. She is the... uh, She's done a lot of stuff, but she's in Sleepwalkers. And most recently, she was in the Hansel and Gretel movie. She was the witch. And she's the Borg Queen in the Star Trek uh, movie First Contact. And then she even showed back up on Voyager. You've also got, besides that, you've got Melvin Douglas and Douglas Fairbanks Jr., who are both also old Hollywood types that have been around forever, and this was their last movie as well. Yeah, every, the men are mad old. Even the, unfortunately, even the actors that played their younger selves in the film also passed away. They all, well, three of them died. Fairly young. Fairly young and like accidental deaths. Yeah. Right? Only, yeah, only Ken Olin is still alive. The rest of them, one was in a car accident, one was in a motorcycle accident, and one was in a bicycle accident. So stay away from uh, bikes, guys. Yeah, which is really weird because, you know, there's a whole thing with certain movies having like curses with them. And this movie's about a ghost story, obviously. So it's just one of those just odd things that just are coincidental yeah it's just kind of strange that that many of them passed away from accidents now when i first saw this movie many ages ago 
I loved it. And I had seen it, probably this is more than likely either my third time watching it. This time around, I was like, no, I, I don't like this movie. <laughs> it's not that I don't like it. Is it, it has plot holes maybe, or just things that just don't add up. And you don't really question it. I didn't really question it the first time because the story, I mean, it's an 80s movie. So it has that pacing. It has that, you know, it reminds me of like the pacing of like the lady in white. You know, it's slow paced and things are happening here and there. But it's not, you really have to follow it. It it unravels as it goes. Yeah, I saw this when I was very young. And of course, yeah. I saw this when I was young, but it was on TV, so the good parts were edited out of it. Oh, okay. And by the good parts, I mean lots of Alice Creech being nude. Yeah, Alice Creech is nude a lot in the film. And, you know, hey, more power to you. She looks fantastic, and she she still looks fantastic in Sleepwalkers. And that was, Sleepwalkers came out in 1990, so. It was 92, so that was like 12 years later. Or thir- uh, my math is terrible. 11 years later, Jesus. Yeah, mm. I don't know. I think it was 1990, but it, nevertheless, it was in the 90s. She looked fantastic. Uh, she's just one of those. I just love her voice. She's she's very hauntingly, no pun intended, beautiful in this film. Yeah. I mean, and but she really can just, there's something about her. That when I see her in the movie, like if I see her name, I'm like, well, she's the evil one. She's the, she's going to be the one that's going to be. There's something not right about her when you see her in a movie. Yeah, for it's sure. It's like when you're watching the credits and you see it say something like, and Malcolm McDowell. You're like, well, that's the bad guy. Now, the film kind of, you know, it. it I don't want to, I mean, I don't want to say I want to give too much away because the movie's 40 years old. <laughs> Yeah, I think if you had an interest in seeing it, you've seen it by now. <laughs> Go watch the movie and then come back and listen to the podcast. You know, a ghost story that we have a group of gentlemen. It's the classic story of a group of gentlemen, the Chowder, right? The Chowder Society. <laughs> chowder Society. Why would you name it the Chowder Society? They weren't in Boston. I, yeah, I don't know. That was a strange name for it. There, I feel like that was probably explained in the book, but they just didn't bother in the movie. I would get it if, like, they ate soup first. Yeah, and then told the stories. Yeah, clam, Chowder, you know. They had some clam chowder, and then they told a ghost story. Exactly, because, you know, you're telling stories. For some reason, I always think you're telling stories. It's cold, you know. Yeah. You're, like, sitting by a fire. Which that, they were. Which they were. What's the best thing to do when you're sitting by a fire? Some soup, some coffee, some hot chocolate, something like that. I'm ready to fucking have some soup right now. Tomato soup with some grilled cheese on the side. Like, hello, can someone make this for me right now? Because I feel like having this. So they have been gathering for many years as the Chowder Society to all tell each other creepy stories. 50 years. Yep. And, of course, this time, when they're finished with their creepy story, they don't know that one of their, the one member, his son, has just been killed. And, they, you know, they get the news shortly after that and find out, and, you know, he's calling his brother to come, his other son to come back with him so they can have the funeral. And that's where everything starts to get creepy in the story. Yeah. Um, no, Shad incorrect it got creepy when he walked up to the chick in his bed that was naked laying face down and he's asking her who are you uh why are you here because remember her hair color was totally different from alex craig's uh, hair so and also her body type she was a little more shapely and shorter i I was really like measuring out every single detail (laughs) and when she turns over her fucking face is like rotting off. She has like white eye, like her whole eyes are like completely white. It is fantastic makeup. Like the makeup in this film for the ghost is marvelous. Yeah, and he's so terrified that he just like stumbles backwards and falls out the window of the hotel they're staying at. And falls down Mm. and through the glass and almost lands in the water of the pool below. Yes. Which is important because water plays a big deal in this. Yes, it does. But let's go back to the man falling from the window. 
the man is falling from the window, but it's 1981. So it's like a green screen. And it's like he's doing like the witchboard fall out the window. <laughs> There's a dick shot. Dick and balls. Full frontal nudity there. And this guy will be playing the other brother as well. So we have already know what this guy's dick and balls look like for the entire movie. And now I can never look at this actor and not see his dick and balls. <laughs> like forever and a day. That's all I'm going to remember. I was shook because I for totally forgot. Maybe the first time I saw it was actually on TV. Because I forgot there was dick and balls. I was like, <gasps> what? Dick and balls? Because it's like, oh, there's a naked girl in the bed. Okay, I'm going to see titties. It's the 80s. Maybe there's going to be a freaking bu- you know, bush shot. That's every movie, right? Dick and balls at this time? Um, very, very, Still pretty very uncommon few. now, much less back in 1981. Madly uncommon in 1981. I feel like more common now. Uh, but yes, yeah, so that happens. And the fall is just, I mean, it's definitely a product of his time. It's a terrible, terrible, uh, I don't want to say CGI. I would say green It was just screen. a green screen, yeah. Yeah. I feel like they could have just thrown a dummy out the window and it would have been better. <laughs> But yeah, after that scene, and I was just totally just, just laughing, you know, and also like <gasps> taking balls. I can't, I can't get over it. I'm still, I'm still haunted. That's uh, that's what I take away from the movie is the haunting of the the D and B. So, you know, I, <laughs> wow. I just there's so many things. There's so many layers. It's like an onion. So we go back. You know, this is my favorite line. The interaction between one of the members, the father and his son, they're sitting at the table, you know, they're d- eating and they're discussing, you know, obviously the terrible thing that happened. The son tells his father, um, I was with the fiance, like the, he was engaged to be married to a girl and he's like spilling his beans saying like he had been with this woman first. The dad is all mad and he he tells him you just come here looking like (laughs) looking like trash like he's a very fancy guy so he didn't say trash he was like you know um, you come here looking you come here dressed like that yeah dressed like that he points at him he's wearing like a fucking varsity like a sweater with a little like plaid button up shirt with the with the dockers he looks like a fucking professor which he was just got off the bus like the, you know, I guess he expected him to get off the bus in a tuxedo. It was yeah. a little harsh. Like in the, I I know for a fact when you go on the bus, do not dress up. This you is, don't want people on the bus to think you have any kind of money. This is very true, but it plays to the scene kind of before this one where the four old men were discussing how in the future. So this is in the eighties. Okay, these men were in their twenties and the thirties. So they're talking, The one of the characters says, oh, you know, in the future, the only time a man will wear a tie is at a wedding, you know, because they already know that it's not fashionable. It's losing fashion to be dressed up in a suit all the time. Like you go into the supermarket, you're in a fucking suit. So then here comes the son, you know, dad is like dressed to the nines at the table. He looks like he just came from like very fucking important meeting. Yeah, he went to the bus station to pick him up in a suit. Yeah, and he's not fucking around. He's like, this is how, you know, I hold myself in public. And you look like a fucking bum, like basically. And and then I also was like, he's like telling him, you know, oh yeah, I, I haven't finished school and this and that. And I was like, how old is this guy? He looks like he's in his 40s. Like, what is he doing? But he was a graduate student. Yeah, finally he was all right. He was teaching some classes at the college and then he was a, a writer in addition to that. And he was taking some classes too. So he was doing things. He wasn't, the dad made that like he was a complete bum. In the midst of everything happening, um, you have these characters, you know, the four men. The meat of the story doesn't really happen until, I don't even know, probably 30 minutes before, 30-ish minutes before the movie. When the movie picks up, when the son tells the ghost story is when things start to propel. But in between, we um, are introduced to the secretary, Alma. Um, and Alma is, she works at the school and, you know, the son is telling his, you know, story. He's like doing like the narration, you know, cause there's narration to this film, kind of like in Silver Bullet, 
where you have yeah. like narration. So it's being narrated, and he's like, oh, that he was seeing someone, and then he met, you know, Alma. And literally, it's like, oh, I had a girlfriend. We were dating. And then the second he sees this new chick, we, bye. He literally dumped her like he saw her. He was like, who's that? And there's the girlfriend says, oh, she's the dean's new secretary. She thinks she's really something. He's like, yeah, she does. Yeah, and she does. And he just went, like, dumped the girl right then. It was off camera, but he immediately went to the secretary and was like, you want to go out tonight? That fucking night. Like, that day. He, didn't, he did not wait, okay? The way that the transition was... He found out who she was. Later on, he's asking her out. Like, he did not wait at all. But I guess maybe it wasn't that serious. And, you know, no offense, but she was like the choir teacher or something. I don't know what yeah, the fuck she, she was. Yeah, she taught choir. And she looked like she taught choir. She just had the big old, like, barber glasses and, like, the 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 bun poof like hair it, it was not a good look for her she was very unattractive compared to this other woman then later they went and had sex in a bathroom right outside the room where the choir teacher was teaching choir so that was a classy move on their part yeah this now i'm gonna <laughs> i don't this is not a word okay but you know i'm gonna say that the care the son what the fuck is his name because we're giving us no son don don how can i forget that jesus don okay he was pusnatized okay because he has sex with alma and the the sex is like it's raining he takes she takes him back to his apartment because they were like on a carousel or some shit he takes him back to the apartment they have like naked they're, they're both fully naked rolling around in the freaking rug you know like it looked like porno-esque yeah they i'm pretty sure they were actually just doing it yeah they looked like they were really fucking like it was intense and then after that don decides you know off camera obviously he this decision's made um i'm done all i'm gonna do is now is chase this fucking skirt and i don't need to go to work i don't need to grade my papers don't need to finish working on my book i am just gonna neglect everything and become like a bum i'm so obsessed with her he becomes so obsessed and i'm like man that must have been that must have been some good pee but it was Because every time that they were doing it, she was very scandalous. She was very free with her sexuality. A, kudos to you, okay? She was asking him to finger her at the fucking five-star restaurant in front of everybody. Like, they're not even in a fucking corner, you know, under the shadows. It was, like, right there in the middle of the whole freaking restaurant. It was like, move over, Sally, you know, from Harry Harry Met Sally. She had nothing on her. I'm pretty sure the waiter was the same waiter from the Blues Brothers at the fancy restaurant in the Blues Brothers. I gotta show you that because you can see. I think it's the same guy. That's hilarious. It would be if it was the same. Yeah, guy. he's just standing there watching and going, ah, um, ah, excuse me. Uh, did did you want to order some food or did you just come here for this? Yeah, didn't they? Like he said, they had sex in the thing. They were just having sex all over the place. She was a wild woman, which is why he lost his mind. Yeah, and the first thing he finds when he goes back to his dad's, and you know, he's not there very long before the dad throws himself off a bridge. And everyone's like, oh, he was just old and confused. That's the kind of thing that happens. And he's like, no, pretty sure he was killed by a ghost because I found this picture of the four of you when you were younger with this girl, and it's the same girl that I was banging everywhere and that my brother was going to marry. And she's the same age, so this has to be a ghost. They're just about, that's fair logic right there. (laughs) It's got to be a ghost. (laughs) No. Okay. This is where the movie takes a turn for me because it's just like, we haven't even introduced the, her sidekicks because she fucking has sidekicks because like a ghost needs one, right? But she has two. Some guy from California that like left California that was like a cult leader. He'd been locked up in an asylum And then, I guess, a kid that he recruited at the asylum, they're her buddies that hang out and they're helping her scare the old men now. And they live, you know, they're squatting at her house, which has been deteriorating for like 50 years. They're just there. And she's talking to them and like doing her bidding. Because 
it was very strange and they don't explain jack shit so if you're looking for any explanation no also how the fuck did she have a job how did she feel real how was she able to have sex the waiter saw her this is not a sixth sense situation where it's like everything is from the point of view from dawn and then you know no even to the point where when he when they break up because he you know is like i guess he lost the put the pusmatism you know and he's like oh shit this bitch is crazy because she would just be spouting crazy shit i'm going to tear through you you know yeah. standing butt naked booty naked in the moonlight you know it's like uh what and she is kept wanting on? to go back home take me back to your hometown introduce me to your family i want to get married in your hometown in the chapel where you used to kneel and pray to god and i want everyone there that everyone you know in the whole town to be in the chapel was like okay that's not odd at all so he lost interest real quick when he got when he saw like okay she crazy so we gotta break up yeah he goes looking for her afterwards at obviously the school and opens the door to where she was you know the secretary to like the dean and there's another woman there she's like no she didn't turn in she didn't come into work she didn't call out she just disappeared so other people had interacted with her how the fuck and then when he went to front check on her house her house was empty with no furniture and nothing on the walls it looked like it had been deserted there was one painting there was one painting on the wall. He did not see it because he didn't step in that room. They made it, ve- the camera is shot wide and he enters the room and you can see your the camera's in the other room, okay? He enters to the, to the living room. He never goes to the second room where the camera's at. On the left, the camera pans forward to him and closes in on him when he enters but when it does on the left there's a painting and the painting there is a naked woman with red hair put up like an um uh a, a certain like 1920s i forgot the name of it but she's poofed up there and someone is coming through the door like a white figure it's a fuck like i saw the painting and i was like that painting is freaky as fuck and also where can i buy this painting because it is miraculous um so that was a hint for the audience hint hint she a ghost (laughs) if you didn't already know there was something off with her (laughs) yeah so he fans are telling all the the old guys this that are still around they confide in him that yeah, that's definitely her. That's definitely uh, Eve. Or and uh, we're getting some chimed in from the cats now. But they're like, yeah, um, we did the worst thing ever to her. We we killed her. And you find out that she was their friend back in the '30s. That she hung out with them all the time. Was having a good time. Was ended up dating one of them. And the night they tried to have sex, the guy couldn't get it up. So he got a little angry, took her home. Because it was Ricky. Yeah. And then, or Nettie, they kept calling him. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Even though he, even, she called him Nettie, but then his actual name was Edward. So Edward, that, yes, that was Nettie, Nettie. But, so, then they all the guys get drunk, go back to her house, and you get this bad feeling like, oh, this is not going to go well. This is going to be like... A situation where she's not going to be able to say no. And it gets a little weird, but then she kind of like gets weird too. She starts to like want to dance, make him dance with her. And during this, she gets shoved by one of them and falls and hits her head on the fireplace and is dead. The one that's going to medical school checks her out and is like, well, she's dead. And we're not going to tell anybody about this, of course. Let's just put her body in the car and shove the car in the lake and let that be that. Uh, you know, it's a 30, so you could do that kind of shit. You could do that. No one would even question you. So they do. And it was for white men in 30, so it's like, mm. Yeah, they were, at the worst, they were going to get a fine. And <laughs> they shove the car in the lake, and of course, just as the car goes under, they see that she turns and puts her hand against the window and starts banging on it that she's she's alive. My favorite part is when they're all standing there and it's a the pan, the camera is literally panning from eye to eye and it's just like that Morticia Adams. It was just her eyes like, <gasps> like freaking the fuck out. No one is doing anything. And then finally Edward jumps in to fucking save her. But alas, it's too fucking late. Now, 
so then it's obvious, like, okay, she's a ghost. She's taking revenge on the men that did this and the one that had kids, apparently. That was the only one in the, in the movie that had kids. Yes. And at least that they said. And so she's taking revenge on them and their families, and she's using these people to do it. Now, what's weird that they they kind of... This might have helped if they had put left this in the movie, but in the book... The scene where they pushed her the car into there, just before the car goes underwater, she disappears from the car, and they look up and they see like a lynx on the, uh, the the cat on the other side of the lake, and it runs away. In the book, you find out that she was not just a normal girl; she was a shape shifting creature that had been alive for thousands of years. And that she had she had seen the first humans. Yeah, they said how she had seen the first humans, and then she's taking revenge on them. Of course, years later, when they're older, why she waited, I don't know. But she's taking revenge on them and their families, and she has done this in the book. She's hooked up with many, a couple of them's kids, killed them, and then comes and kills the father as well. And that's why she's using the people like the crazy cult leader and all this is because she was recruiting people to be like her like henchmen and servants because she's this immortal creature which is insane and also um stephen king come on you know that you love peter straub and you were like mm, sleepwalkers because literally she's in sleepwalkers she's playing like an a immortal, creature that's been around forever forever and ever from like the egyptian fucking times and so i see where stephen king was like hey why don't we just get Alice Krieg to play this? Yeah, which, I mean, she does wonderfully. But it's just so crazy to me. The movie doesn't make sense as a ghost it, as a ghost story because she is able to materialize... And interact with people who she's not specifically haunting. Exactly. And like it, she, like I mean, it, the bitch had a job. It wasn't like she was working there for like two days. It had been some time. I'm not, yeah. I, we, you don't really know, but it, it wasn't like she got the job and the next day she didn't show up to work. Yeah. And like, like if it'd been, it would have been one thing if like the only people that could really see her and interact with her were the Chowder Society and the guy's kids. Yeah. But like... Everybody could see it. Like you said, she had a job. She's typing up papers. She's sending out shit. She's doing things at the job. So it would have made more sense to have had it in the movie that, hey, she's not just a normal person. There was something more to her to begin with. And it's kind of strange because in the movie, they eventually pull the car up out of the lake and find her body in it. And the body kind of turns towards the guy. Turns it's a toward, really cool fucking scene. Turns towards Fred Astaire and kind of like walks, stumbles, could have fallen out. It kind of is open-ended it's in the movie. It's insinuated the way that it's shot in the movement that she's literally getting out of the car and walking towards Fred Astaire. And then she falls out into the sunlight and just kind of, you know, falls to pieces in a very gruesome scene. with well, like the It was skin. nighttime, but yes, she falls out. Well, I thought it was dated because it is daytime because the sun's coming up later. Like, it's not too far into the night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, her fucking skin just, like, falls right the fuck off. Yeah, which... it's it's like like a freaking piece of chicken that you, like, cook super tin and you just, like, touch it and the skin falls off. Yeah, her skin just starts sloughing off. But yeah. So, I, I feel like they kind of left a little bit of the elements in from the mo- from the book, but not enough to really justify it, you know? It is very strange, but the effects, I mean, the, you know, the ghost body, whatever, looks fantastic. I mean, I, that's, this, it, this one makes a movie to me. The sex scenes, <laughs> uh, or I should say the sex, well, the sex scene, the, uh, I like the whole, like, we're getting together, kind of like, I mean, I grew up in the 90s, so, you know, Midnight Society, you know, that whole, like, getting together telling fucking stories and that i love that concept you know which plays back to like oh you know the authors getting together you know telling stories to one another playing bouncing off off of one another so i like that and then the other thing is the makeup is just fantastic i mean it just looks so fucking good and so alive i mean it's so wet i mean yeah she came out of the of like from being under the water but it just she's still intact and it's not until like you said that she's falls to the ground that 
she just starts to like like it just slides off her bone it, it's just such a good effect it looks really good that was those are the things that i like about the film i i like the ghost story to some point like you kind of lose it when you do make her real at least throw a line in there like you know she gets her power and is able to materialize the more that she kills and you know or the souls that she's able to like devour something to fucking keep this creature you know yeah, living it's, it's kind of like ambiguous like exactly what kind of a ghost apparition demon she is you know i feel like if they'd included some of the stuff from the book about her being an immortal creature then it would have made a little more sense this is also one of those movies, I think, too, that when you see it very young, you're just kind of impressed with, like, the atmosphere, the costumes, the, like, the design of it. And you're kind of like, excuse me, when I saw it, I was like, ooh, this is a grown-up ghost story. This isn't like a little kid kind of thing. Like, this is a, a grown-up ghost story because everybody in this movie is a thousand years old <laughs> except for the one guy. <laughs> so, like, this is like an adult ghost story. So you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And you don't question a lot of things about it. But when you get older and rewatch it, you're like, hey, wait, you're, you're right. Some of this stuff doesn't quite add up. Why is this? And what is going on here? And it was even kind of ambiguous, like with John Hausman. He gets attacked by the crazy kid from the asylum. And you're not really sure, like, did he die? Did he, was he able to fight the kid off? You never really know. Yeah, that's true. You don't know. It just cuts a wing. You just assume that he is dead. But he could have. I mean, I mean, yeah, the guy is old, but he's fighting a kid. Maybe he could have got away from him, got something. Yeah, even to the point, well, John Houseman had never seen the kid. I don't know if they had told him. I think they did they tell him, yeah. like, the guy's hanging around with this kid. But the And then the other thing is they even made it a point there was a trucker. That's why he kind of swerved off the road because there was a trucker that was going they were going to have a head-on yeah, like collision, snowplow. the snowplow. So the snowplow driver looks back at the car. He stops and like opens the door, looks out and sees the car there. And then that's it. It cuts away. So he could have easily gone down there and we helped him know. out. We don't know. There was just again nothing very big. ambiguous. Yeah. So I would uh, on our system, I would give it like a a two and a half skulls. It's it's fine. Or knives. We always messed up this thing now. We got to figure this out one day. <laughs> it's skulls because of all the people that died in this movie. That's right. So we'll give this one two and a half skulls because of the the acting, the effects. There's a the movie looks gorgeous. Everything in it, you know, everyone does a great job. It's just there's some plot holes and things that are kind of weird. Yeah, I also I give it the same rating. It's in I do like it's enjoyable and they're actors. I mean, I love Fred Astaire and you know I love Alice and they're actors that you've seen time and time and again. So it's like going in if you're if you know who these people are and their body of work, it's like oh okay I'll see this movie because I'm interested in seeing yeah. them act. You know, um, but if you have no attachments to anyone. You know, watch it with fresh eyes because who knows? Like I said, I've seen this movie. Like the first time I saw it, I never. I just said, "Hey, that's a creepy fucking ghost story." Like I never took away, you know, like oh this and that and this and that. Who the fuck knows what I was thinking? But I was able to at least enjoy the film. <laughs> yeah, it's not a bad movie. It just it, it, there needs to be a little more context. I feel like this is one of those ones that. If they, I'm not sure what they did with Scream Factory, I think, put it out. But I feel like this is one that if you saw the deleted scenes, it might clear things up for you. There might be some deleted scenes that add some clarity, you know? That's true. There might be some deleted scenes. Well, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the 40th anniversary of Ghost Story. Stay tuned to the horror. And now, folks, it's time to say good night. We sincerely appreciate your patronage and hope we've succeeded in bringing you an enjoyable evening of entertainment. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon. Good night.